Another Doctor Who day went by this year, and as has become customary for Big Finish Productions, they released a brand new Ninth Doctor Adventure set on Doctor Who Day. This is Series 2, Volume 3, Hidden Depths. We've got the series finale, uh, uh, Series 2, Volume 4, coming out in February. So this is the last modern incarnation of the Doctor coming out in a Big Finish box set for 2022. So let's end it with a banger for Hidden Depths. This is a box set which brings back Christopher Eccleston as the Ninth Doctor and as you can see from the cover as well we've got Liv and Tanya from the Eighth Doctor Adventures specifically Stranded and we've also got Stuart the Sea Devil here this is the Ninth Doctor encountering the Sea Devils because that's been a bit of a recurring theme for this series two box sets we've got him having a Sontaran story we had uh, for the finale for um, series one the Mondasian Sidemen and the Brigadier there's just a lot of nostalgia to be gleaned from having the Ninth Doctor interactive species that he never did on screen well actually there's still the war doctor hush now flip hush hush flip seed you've you are you are correctly correcting me so hidden depths is a trilogy of stories we've got the seas of titan by elizabeth miles we've got lay down your arms by lisa mcmullen and we've got flat pack by john dorney we're going to start from the beginning with the seas of titan which sees the ninth doctor on the moon titan which is one of the moons of saturn and there is a colony base which is being led by diana hendry played by sasha behar who is the leader of an expedition who is making their way uh through the seas of titan and there surprise surprise you can see by the cover they encounter a race of sea devils there who have been established there for centuries when they were just um when they were the dominant life form on the planet along with the silurians millions of years ago they launched spaceships out to explore the stars and they landed on the moon of titan and they've established a base there and they've been there for a long time and also we have an assistant there who's assisting diana called rachel so it's this two-person team on this colony who are trying to extract resources from Titan and explore all of the, the life forms that live there. And the Ninth Doctor seeing a group of humans in an impossible scenario on the moon of Titan, uh, surpassing all of the odds and expectations, he can't help but admire them. Let's play a clip from the Seas of Titan. Better hurry, the storm's rolling our way. Your habitation don't seem better days. Back to Lusa, Titan's last colony. So those others are empty? Abandoned. And Seleucia's having a hard time, what with the sickness and shortages. This is your first time in the outer worlds. Probably not. I have a terrible memory. History's always a right model. There was a lot of interest in Titan when Earth was throwing out the first interstellar missions. This was the last refuel station before they hit the void. But technology advanced. Yep. Now most ships get their energy from cold fusion. Any vessels that need hydrocarbons are decades old and falling apart. And when demand for your Planetoids 1 export plummets, that's a sign you should get out. You're still here. My university didn't want me back. Off-world deep sea exploration isn't a very profitable speciality. You haven't given up, though. You're still exploring. On a rickety submarine made of satellite scraps and a lot of hope. This moon wants to kill you. If it doesn't freeze you to death, it'll suffocate you. And you still want to dive into its seas, down into a sunless black world, because there's the tiniest chance this icy death ball might have given birth to life of its own. Some days humanity takes my breath away. So, yeah, major arc in space and impossible planet vibes. You know, human race, you know, they're indomitable. Indomitable. Anyway, so the Seas of Titan takes place on the moon of Titan. And because there's this colony that is uh, butting heads with the sea devils, who are the dominant species on the moon of Titan, there is, of course, the traditional tension that you'd get between the humans and the reptilia. And... You know, we've seen this play out before in the classic series, in the revival, in loads of different spin-off and uh, expanded media interpretations of the Sea Devil and the Silurians, you know, who has got the stake to the planet, who's got the stake to the resources, and, you know, who was here first, etc., etc. We, we know all of that, basically. It is, uh, it is very well-worn territory. I will say, though, for the Seas of Titan, it's a very good version of it. It is not trying to push the boat out 
extraordinarily. You know, this is stuff that we've seen before. This is territory that Doctor Who, with the Sea Devils and the Silurians, has uh, staked its claim to before. But I think it's just a really good version of that story. We've got a character called Solomon, who is played by Ferdy Roberts, who is sort of like the leader of the colony, who's sort of like financing the thing and is the business person in charge. And of course, he's like, yeah, let's let's tear down the, the Sea Devils underwater civilization because that, you know, we've also got a plague that is taking over our colony and we think the Sea Devils might have done it and, you know, it's kill or be killed, stuff like that. And I think that, you know, it's well-worn territory, but I do think that the Seas of Titan and what Lisbeth Miles brings to the Seas of Titan is a very topical and very interesting sort of like rhetorical strategy that causes tension between the two sides. There's a scene about halfway through where Solomon is uh, over a tannoy speaker, is talking to the people of the colony and says, you know, there are monsters here. They're going to kill us. They're, going to, they're, they're evil creatures and stuff. And then when they actually do try to broker a peace and the leader of the Sea Devil colony, who's voiced by Nicholas Briggs, who plays the other Sea Devils as well, his name's Myrtar. When the leader of the Sea Devils tries to do a peace mission to the human colony and, and comes up to the surface and goes into the colony before they can even start brokering peace the human beings on the colony start lashing out and start being violent because solomon has poisoned the water like you know he has sort of made things so inhospitable before they've even started and it kind of reminded me and of course this is where my mind goes to that Trump speech, that Donald Trump speech early on uh, in his presidential run, where he said, you know, Mexicans are coming across the border, they're rapists, they're evil, and some, I presume, are good people. You know, it, it was like, it didn't matter what happened afterwards, because to him and his audience and his cult, basically, he had now poisoned the well. That That demographic now was just unwaveringly evil in the perspective of his followers now it doesn't matter what happened afterwards because he has now tainted the entire discussion rhetorically and i think that was a really interesting approach to take this dynamic like okay we could try and broker peace between the humans and the sea devils but what happens to the side who gets their rhetoric out first? And I found that to be really interesting. We've also got um, Yasmin Mwanza, who is playing Rachel, who is the assistant to Diana in, in the colony. But Yasmin also plays Taroth, who is the sea devil scientist. So you've got this sort of conflict between Mirtar, who is thinking, you know, you know th these, these people are scientists. They've not brought weapons with them. They've come here to broker peace. And you've got Taroth, who is the scientist sea devil, who is like, no we must kill them or we'll kill or be killed we could maybe try and do the, you know it's stuff that has been well worn in doctor who before and in these stories before but the seas of titan is just a really good version of it and i liked the ending of the story as well sound design is terrific i think that the doctor and diana had a great chemistry with each other it's not a romantic chemistry but it's it is the doctor admiring the indomitable human spirit it's just it's a good dynamic and the ninth doctor wears that dynamic really well and it was cool to see the ninth doctor have a story with um the uh the, the sea devil species uh what, what's that because they the silurians are called homo reptilia what the, what the sea devils called reptilia sapiens something like that reptilia sapiens sapiens uh, yeah he uses that name for them he's like oh they're actually called sea devils they were called that in the 20th century but you probably shouldn't call them that like you, it, it's it's stuff that we've heard before. It's not like Salvation 9, where Timothy X Attack in the last box set gave us a Sontaran story that was utterly and completely unique. We don't have that here, but what we do have with the Seas of Titan is just a very good version of the Sea Devil story that we've seen before. And it was solid. I enjoyed it. The sound design's terrific. You've got all of these great underwater scenes when they're exploring the Seas of Titan. That's really cool. I liked it. I liked it a lot. It sounded uh, it sounded really good came together really well i like the seas of titan now lay down your arms by lisa mcmullen is the uh, obligatory historical story of this ninth doctor set where the ninth doctor is in 19th century germany specifically he's in the 1860s and the ninth doctor has befriended bertha kinski played by kate sissons and they're at this spa where Bertha has been brought there by her mother in order to try and find a husband. And not only any husband, but a husband with a title, whether it be sir, whether it be doctor, whether it be noble, whatever. Basically, 
they want to try and marry her above her station because that's how a woman makes a living in the 19th century and the doctor has somehow found a way to become her opera teacher uh, because um, Bertha wants to become a singer to become independent but she cannot carry a tune let's play a clip from lay down your arms Mother has me so riled up. Because she wants you to marry a doctor. Because she wants me to marry full stop. But preferably a full stop with a title, a coat of arms and a castle. Why do you think I asked you to give me singing lessons? Well, I have been wondering. You know I'm not actually... I want to be self-sufficient. I need to earn my own living. Ergo, I need a profession. And opera singer is the most obvious career path, is it? What other options are there? Let's see, Germany. Well, the new German Confederation, 1864... Yeah, fair enough. Women aren't exactly spoilt for choice. The ceiling's not so much made of glass as dwarf star alloy. I suppose so. And the world's changing all the time anyway. I can't keep up. One minute, France is at war with Austria. Then Montenegro's at war with the Turks. Last year, the Kingdom of Poland rose up against Russia, but that's now forgotten and Prussia's at war with Denmark. The world's in constant flux. Everyone's fighting everybody else, but the world doesn't change. Not really. A few lines move on a map. And the soldiers return to a hero's welcome. Not every soldier. But that's their choice, isn't it? To join the army? Maybe. But it seems to me a pretty high price to pay for a few extra inches on an ordnance survey. Oh dear. How gloomy we are. Shall we begin the lesson? Right you are. Let's start with a warm-up. You're not joining in! I'm afraid I don't know that one. Are you sure that's operatic? Well, how about the one I taught you yesterday? That's definitely operatic. No go, Flotro Woe? That's the one. Jadoon Opera. Bit staccato, but on the plus side, mercifully short. So, yeah, it's a fun clip. I could have played so much more of that scene because that's just a really great... Um, it's just a really great establishing scene, not just because it establishes the dynamic between the Ninth Doctor and Bertha, but because it also lays the groundwork for that setting where it basically seems like everybody is at war for very inconsequential reasons, just to move lines on a map. And if there's one really cool thing that I liked about Lay Down Your Arms and what Lisa McMullen did with the story is that it took the, the subtext of the era and just made it the text with a sci-fi trapping around it. You know, the, that Garth Marenghi clip. I know writers who use subtext and they're all cowards. What we've got with, um, with Lay Down Your Arms is a story where underneath this spa in Germany, the Ninth Doctor and Bertha, and we've also got Ludwig von Hasseldorf, played by Joseph Kloska, they go underneath this spa and they find that there's this alien species there which are using the residents of this spa to enact their own sick war games where they are taking half of the people from the spa, taking them... They're putting them in one end of this field and then the other half on the other end of the field branding them either red or blue and then just getting them to fight each other to resolve their own conflicts and it was that sort of existential idea that i love about sci-fi it always it almost seemed a little bit lovecraftian about these ideas these um these concepts and these creatures that are just beyond our understanding and beyond our capabilities where you know humanity is a warmongering race especially depicted in the doctor who universe and the material throughout history and that's where the setting of lay down your arms takes place where the entire world seems to be at war with each other for no reason well what happens when an alien race comes along and they do war a hell of a lot better and i think that's the sort of interesting idea at the heart of lay down your arms and it's also one reason i think the sontarans are so interesting as well where you've got this warmongering species that live and breathe war and it's their best desire to be killed on the battlefield so it's like okay the sontarans would easily win any conflict with earth even though earth is a warmongering planet it was a really cool idea and the way that it all came together at the end for Bertha Kinski, I did not see the ending coming because I did not know the historical context of the setting or who Bertha actually was. But it was a very cool, like, last minute twist. And then when I listened to the behind the scenes, it was something that was meant to be the focus of the entire story. So, whoops, that's just me being terrible at any sort of, um, at any sort of history or any knowledge around Germany in the mid to late 19th century. So I humbly apologize for that, but I loved the direction that it went in and the associations with the other characters that Bertha has as well. I can't talk too much in terms of the actual spoilers of the story, unfortunately, but rest assured that the title Lay Down Your Arms 
is incredibly clever and not just because it's an anti-war story but because lay down your arms shares a name with another famous bit of text and that's probably enough information that i can give you without completely spoiling everything that happens in this story but yeah lay down your arms was really good i said at the beginning it's like the obligatory ninth doctor historical story and i was kind of being a bit flippant when i said that but i mainly thought that because the historical stories for these ninth, for these ninth doctor sets typically haven't been my favorite there was the historical story uh, in back to earth the false dimitri i wasn't a big fan of that one there was the uh, the lady macbeth one in lost warriors i just haven't been a big fan really of these ninth doctor historical stories but this one though lay down your arms was really good i actually think it might be my favorite of the three i think it was it went in such interesting directions the existential love crafty and threat of the villain themselves was really terrifically realized i loved the villains in this story really 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 liked them and their whole deal and their whole shtick and lay down your arms just came together really really solidly this was just a really good story really appreciated that one and the last story in this trilogy is flat pack by john dorney and this is where we get a little bit interesting in terms of the continuity of the big finish stories the ninth doctor is meeting former companions live and Tanya, played by Nicola Walker and Rebecca Root, respectively. And these are Eighth Doctor companions who are reuniting with a future incarnation now in Flatpak, where the Ninth Doctor, Liv and Tanya, are exploring a brand new Flatpak furniture store in London, where everybody goes in, but nobody seems to come out. And also, it seems like the, this furniture store has been there for decades, but was it was just a plot of land a couple of weeks ago. So what's happening with the history of this store? And why are all of the uh, staff members inside wearing these really, really creepy creepy black and white masks and they have no names they only have numbers what is flat pack what is going on here well we also have some questions uh for Liv because she wants to know what happened to her version of the doctor and there's some really cool scenes and in, and um in interactions between Liv and the the ninth doctor let's play a quick clip from flat pack come on keep up we're trying to just have to follow the floor plan doctor if you're kicking us out I can't help but feel there's something you're not telling us. There's all manner of things I'm not telling you, Liv. The average lifespan of a hummingbird, the annual rainfall in Waterloo, the fascinating story behind the making of the movie Wings. You know what I mean. And you know who I am. If I'm not telling you, I'm not telling you for a reason. I mean, I don't know you. Not this you. Not really. I'm the same as I ever was. Except you're not. And you are. Regeneration, eh? It complicates things. I mean, I knew it'd happen eventually. It happened before, after all, but... It's weird, right? Yeah. I don't know what to feel. I've just found out that one of my best friends died, except he hasn't. Because he's only dead in my past. And because you're still him. He's out there somewhere. And you're here. We both are, in a way. That's what makes it difficult. The old me could still pop round Baker Street tomorrow, so how can you grieve? We can't grieve for someone who hasn't gone. Exactly, time travel. No one ever really dies, but that means you can never really mourn. I know that all too well. Wait. Does it work the other way around? Am I dead for you? Are we both dead? You know, Liv, I think that might be a discussion best held somewhere other than a crowded furniture store at the weekend. Yeah. Yeah, I suppose that's true. Look, forget all that. It's good to see you, Doctor. It always is. And you. You seem happy. I am. We are. Good. I've no doubt that these characters are being well served by the story. This is written by John Dorney, who has written a story for basically every single Stranded box set. So, you know, these are characters who he does have a partial prior ownership with. So I'm sure that that works. But I'm in two minds about Flatpak. Because Flatpak, the actual sci-fi story about the identity of the, the staff members there, what exactly the deal is here, why there are numerous TARDISes turning up uh, in the display cabinets and things like that. I thought that, you know, that stuff was really interesting, was really, really fun, and I really, really enjoyed that. But the actual drama between Liv and, um, and Tanya and the and the ninth doctor i found that a little bit lacking and not because it was written or performed poorly as you heard from that clip there's some really interesting existential ideas going on especially how you know uh Liv is meeting 
a future incarnation of her doctor confirming that he at some point does die and she does lose him that's really interesting i actually think it's a bit disappointing though because it stunts the ninth doctor's character a little bit because we're doing the same thing here as we did in old friends in that brigadier story with the ninth doctor that ended season one in way of the Boryman and the fourth generation by roy gill where we've got the ninth doctor who's refusing to talk about the time war and i think that Obviously, we can't tread too much over Series 1 from 2005, and we can't have the Ninth Doctor be emotionally open about the Time War with anybody other than Rose Tyler. But I'm a bit worried that because we're playing this card again, and because we've got the Ninth Doctor refusing to open up or mention the Time War or what happened or anything with characters who he has a prior relationship with, whether it be Liv, Tanya or the Brigadier, it does feel a little bit like the Ninth Doctor right now is running in place. And that's a bit of an issue when we're nearing the end of Season 2 of the Ninth Doctor Adventures on Big Finish. I think it's it's a bit disappointing that we don't even have a negative dynamic come out of this, where the Ninth Doctor maybe does tell Liv and or Tanya about the Time War, and they maybe reject him, or give him some pushback, or ask some questions that he does not like the answers to. I think that would be the, a way to move the Ninth Doctor's character forward in these box sets without stepping on the toes of the 2005 series, but I understand why they want to try and keep these as more light-hearted stories for the ninth doctor but it also means that the more we do this and the more we have these stories pre-rose the less that story arc between the ninth doctor and rose is gonna make sense thankfully there's too much going on in flat pack there's too much complicated jiggery pokery and mechanics of the story to really get bogged down in the emotion of it and I actually think that the flat pack story, where did the shop come from, who's running it, what's the technology behind it, that's the really interesting stuff. That's my favourite part of the story. Maybe I'd have a bit more uh, emotional attachment to Tanya and Liv if I'd listened to Stranded, but I've not listened to any of Stranded. We had Philip in the chat earlier who was explaining that between like the penultimate scene of the last story of Stranded, Liv goes away with the Eighth Doctor has a bunch of adventures, which is the current 8th Doctor range right now, and then maybe comes back at the end of Stranded, and that's where the events of this story pick up from. Where it's been several months to a year since Liv and Tanya saw the Doctor, and then all of a sudden they go to this flat pack furniture store, and the TARDIS is there, and a brand new version of the Doctor comes out. So that's apparently where that works. If I'd listened to Stranded, if I had more of an interest in the dynamic between Liv and Tanya, I'd probably maybe enjoy Flatpak flat pack a bit more, other than just the current A plot of the story that John Dorney has put together. Presumably he got lost in Ikea, and had an existential crisis, and wrote a 60-minute Big Finish story about it. Either way, I really liked that stuff, and the way it was performed and put together. Very clever use of the voice cast. That's all I'll say. With the voice cast that they choose for these stories, it's a bit obvious when you listen to Flatpak, but the directions that they go in, the different spin that they give to these voices, I really, really liked it, particularly Eccleston. But that was my favourite part about Flatpak, and I have a feeling that might have not been the intention. I think that maybe the big sell of this was, oh, Liv and Tanya are back, these are like big Finnish favourite companions, and they've got a new version of the Doctor, who is also like a fan favourite Doctor. For me, that was the least interesting part of the story. Not just because I haven't listened to Stranded, but because it kind of reminded me of where the ninth Doctor is, and big Finnish, we are now seven box sets in, we have like done over 20 stories with the Ninth Doctor, and he hasn't really gone anywhere, which is part of the point. These Big Finish stories are meant to be almost emotional placeholder stories, but I think that Eccleston can take the character further if given the material to do so. And I found the title Hidden Depths to be a little bit ironic because the stories were great. They were thematically very well linked. You know, these hidden places, you know, just in the corner of your eye or underground or under the sea, things like that. Thematically very rich. Three very good, very solid stories. But the depths, you know, they're not quite where they should be. You're kind of waiting for these stories to take that extra little push to make them just a bit more profound, 
a bit more interesting. And with the exception of the second one, Lay Down Your Arms, they they really don't, unfortunately. The Seas of Titan is a really great Sea Devil story, and that's kind of it. Flat Pack is a really fun, timey wimey, jiggery pokery story about IKEA furniture, and that's kind of it. So Lay Down Your Arms is the standout of the three. And this is not a bad box set by any stretch of the imagination. It is just reminding me that I think they should be doing more with the Ninth Doctor. And I think Eccleston's capable of doing it. I think the writers at Big Finish are capable of doing it. I just think there needs to be some sort of top-down executive decision from whoever the producers of these sets are. Who's the producer? David Richardson. I think David Richardson should just say, let's go a bit further with this character and screw the implications for what happens with him and Rose Tyler. We just need to take this incarnation of the Doctor further.